Grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter 4. We want to extend our uh, condolences to uh, Mark and Denise Smith, Jeff and Teresa uh, Woosley, uh, Paul and Jordan Balangi, and then Mike and Megan Germany, and the loss of Sue Wise. Uh, Sue Wise was a member of our church for many, many years and uh, was a shut in. And this um, end of this week, she went to be with the Lord at 79 years old. And, uh, so be praying for that family. And if there's anything more we can do, the family will let us know. All right, not this Sunday coming, but the Sunday after is the Lord's Supper Fellowship. And you can see this picture. We are in the NPR room, and we're getting some instructions from Jan Scott about how we're getting ready to eat. This is an event catered by Mission Barbecue. Um, you say, why are we charging? It's real simple so that we know how many people are coming. Why don't we do a potluck, all right? Here's the answer. It's real simple. Y'all don't bring enough food. <laughs> That's the reality. And so we literally live out the problem in 1 Corinthians where some eat really good and some don't get any food. That's, it happened a couple of years ago. I was on the receiving end of it. Um, it's not fun. You have a real bad attitude going into the Lord's Supper when you didn't get any food on your plate. Um, and if Chad Hillen's here this morning, he knows what I'm talking about. We were at the same table. Um, we got the, the crumbs from the master's table is what we ate. Um, we're mixing all kinds of biblical metaphors. We're all over the map this morning. But in any case, Mission Barbecue is catering. If you don't like Mission Barbecue, bring something organic. Nuts, berries, uh, green vegetables, whatever you want. Just come. If you consider yourself part of this family, then you should be there. And uh, how do I uh, register? Text uh, 910-601-2425. And then all together, Lord's Supper, no spaces. That'll bring up the registration. We do need you to register. Please do not wait for the 24th. We have to tell the catering agency something early. All right, let's get into the Word of God. John chapter 4, verse 43. After two days, Jesus departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no home in his own town. This is inserted parenthetically in the ESV. Again, that's a translator uh, call. There are no parentheses in the Greek. We'll talk about this unique statement. So when he, referring to Jesus, came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem. We're talking about miracles, signs. For they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Canaan in Galilee in verse 46, where he made the water to wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And then look at verse 48 with me. So Jesus looks at him and says, unless you, unless you, and what's unique about this word you here in the Greek, it's plural. In other words, he's talking to more than just him. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that it was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was the second sign that Jesus did when he was come from Judea. Turn back to chapter 2. I want to show you something unique. Go ahead and look at verse 11 in chapter 2. This, the first of his signs. Do you see it? This, the first of his signs, and the disciples believed. 
Now what's unique about this is there is no third sign. There's no fourth sign. It's there, but the language is not present. He doesn't keep this going. He doesn't say the third sign, the fourth sign, the fifth sign, the sixth sign. He only says first and he only says second. I think he wants us to treat this scripture, this section of scripture, I'm holding my hands up, those li listening on the audio. My left hand is chapter two, my right hand is the end of chapter four. And he wants us to analyze this narrative right here in its totality. So we're gonna do that this morning by this inclusion of first sign and this conclusion of second sign. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us, O oh God, this morning to make the most of our time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So he's now leaving where? Where was he at last week? Where was he at, church? Samaria. Samaria, that's right. And how was his reception in Samaria? How well was he received? Yes, it was good. It was a solid reception. After two days, he departed for Galilee. And then 44 is very interesting because now we have this proverb in which Jesus quotes that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. Now, now we think hometown Nazareth, but it seems as though he's referring to all of the Galilee region right here. So when he, Jesus, came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They received him. And then we have this statement as to why they received him. Because they have seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. So John is inserting a definitive difference between Jesus' reception in Samaria that was based on his person, that is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior of the world, versus his reception in Galilee where the miracle worker is being welcomed home. All right, how do we know that? Let's look back at John chapter 2, verse 23. <coughs> Turn back to John chapter 2, verse 23. The text reads, Now when he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover, many believed in his name when they saw the signs, the miracles that he was doing. So, so the first miracle is the wedding at Canaan. The second is the official son being healed. But in between there, according to John, many miracles were done. Enough that he got a reputation for being a miracle worker. And in John chapter 4, we read that they were there. They were there down at the feast. They saw. It says, when they heard that the man Jesus was from Judea, I'm in verse 47, he went to him and asked him, I'm uh, sorry, the previous verse, uh, 45. So when he came to Galilee, a Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So earlier, they all got out to the Passover, left side of the church, down over here, he does all kinds of miracles and gains this reputation for being able to perform signs. All right, now word's getting back. We're back up north in Galilee. The miracle worker's coming back. So they open him with open arms. Why should they? He does crazy miracles. And I want my miracle. And so do you. Don't you want your miracle? Everybody wants their own miracle. So they welcome him back. Now, again, it's very important for us to notice here. Make this connection with me, please. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But their belief in his name, having seen the signs that they were doing back over here on this side of the church, this one up here, is that a legitimate, authentic belief? No. How do we know that? Look at the next, very next verse. 24. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them. There was not a reciprocation. The actual Greek, John, is the exact same Greek. Literally, it reads, they believed and he did not believe in them. That's the literal rendering. So they believed, but he knew that their belief was not in him as a savior, but as a what? A miracle worker. And so does he reciprocate? No, he doesn't. Those same people, I've got my hands like this, making those same people are now up here in Galilee. And he says to them, unless you see, do you understand that he's rebuking them right now? 
They did believe down there, and he's giving them another opportunity to come to faith by letting them know that their faith is not legit. Thus the rebuke. Because let's face it, the rebuke's kind of out of character of Jesus. And I'll show you that in just a moment, because he doesn't respond this way in other situations. So in John chapter number four, in verse 39 through 42, our previous episode last week, many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him in verse 40, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. Verse 41, and many more believed because of his word. 42, they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we've heard ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. Did you read about all the miracles? No. None. No miracles. So let's get this right. Go back over here with me. Right over here. This is Passover, Jerusalem. Lots of miracles. And their belief is in a miracle worker, not in a Messiah. Everyone tracking. Nod your head if you're tracking. The middle is now Samaria. We're not in Jerusalem anymore. We're in Samaritan. Those half-breeds, right? No miracles whatsoever. And they believe he is the Christ, the Savior of the world. You getting it? Back over here, these are Jewish Galileans. They should be receiving their Messiah. And he said, he gives them the Jewish rebuke. Unless you see signs, you will not believe. He's letting them know that their faith down here in Jerusalem was not an authentic faith. They need to come to Christ. And not to Christ as a miracle worker. They need to come to Christ as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world. Again, I, I, I show you this because I, I tell you, we have chapter two, first sign, chapter four, second sign. And if he kept doing that, then we'd see he has a pattern. But Jeannie doesn't do that. He wants me to study chapters two, three, and four together. All right. Who's in the middle in three? Who's the main character in chapter three? Come on. You guys should know this. Yell, yell, yell it, please. It's Nicodemus. And he doesn't come to faith either. He doesn't come to faith. He doesn't believe. Jesus says to him, if I tell you earthly things and you don't believe it, why would I tell you, come on, heavenly things? Chapter two, Jews are not believing other than miracle worker. Chapter three, a Jewish self-righteous Pharisee doesn't come to Christ. Chapter four, a Samaritan that you're not expecting to come to Christ does come back to Christ. The end of chapter number four, Jews in Galilee who are welcoming him at the miracle worker, you know what they need? They need a solid rebuke. Did Jesus come to do miracles? Only in the sense of authenticating who he was. It was supposed to get you towards where he'd be, not stopping there, moving you towards that. And it works with him, but not with them. And you, I think you know who the him is there. So verse 46, so he came again to Canaan to Galilee. He's at Capernaum. There's an official whose son was ill. And again, we've got three officials in our synoptic gospels, if you include John, four. So we have a centurion. In, in Matthew 9, we have a synagogue official. And this is a Roman centurion. And then in John 4, we have a royal official. There's some debate as to who, what his ethnicity is. We know these are three different stories because we have a servant, we have a daughter, and we have a son. We have a man who's paralyzed, we have a woman, a girl who died, and we have a son who's at the point of death but not yet died. In Matthew 8, Jesus offers to come, and what does the Roman centurion say? Come on, y'all know your Bibles. What's he say? He says, you don't even need to come. I'm a man under authority. You're a man with authority. Say the word and it's done. And Jesus says, not bad. What's he say about the man's faith? It's great. He says, I haven't seen faith like this in anywhere amongst the Jews. He commends him. All right, let's do Matthew 9. The synagogue official comes. His daughter has died. The crowds are laughing at Jesus. And he takes the girl by the hand and brings her back to life. John 4 is much different. This is a royal official. He's got a son. His son is ill to the point of death. He is desperate. He finds Jesus. 
He says to Jesus, come, heal my son. Jesus rebukes him right to his face. Looks right at him and rebukes him. And what does he say? He's totally undeterred. He goes right on and asks him to come down. Look at the rebuke. Unless you see signs and wonders in verse 48, you will not believe. Now let's make three points. Point number one, you're supposed to believe in the person of Christ. This is why he's rebuking them. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Number two, you're supposed to believe without seeing signs and wonders. And number three, which is really remarkable, you're supposed to believe like the Samaritans. Amen. Which is unreal. How did they feel about the Samaritans church? It was harsh, wasn't it? Harsh. Unbelievable biases and prejudices. Let's pause for a moment and remind ourselves that this incredible Greek word, uh, pisteo here, right here, P-I-S-T-E-U-O, is our word for believe and a verb form. Our word for faith is a noun. They're sister words right there. See it right there, P-I-S-T-I-S. Here it is right here, P-I-S-T-E-U-O. This is the verb, this is the noun. What's amazing is in John, 98 times in 85 verses is the word believe. In fact, it's in chapters one through 14, chapter 16 and 17, chapter 19, only 21, 18 and 15 don't have a reference to believe. Other than that, it's everywhere. So if you say, Pastor Sean, you've talked about believing more than once. Well, if we're in John, I've got 98 times to talk about it. You're tracking? It is the central message of the Gospel of John. So believing has always been the issue. Right. Yep. You've got to get this. Many Christians struggle with the question, how did the saints of the Old Testament get saved? And they want to include law. They want to include some form of obedience. Church, it has always been about believing from the very beginning. For example, Eve did not believe she would die if she ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If she did believe, she would not have what? Ate. Or Noah did believe when God told him to build an ark for the saving of his people, as described in the book of Hebrews. Consider with me the case study of Cain. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, Yahweh says to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance, why has your face fallen? Then Yahweh makes a promise. What is that promise? If you do well, here it is, Cain. If you do well, will you not be accepted? There it is right there. Doing well will result in being accepted. Not doing well will, reject, will result in being rejected. If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Sin's desire is contrary to you, but you, Cain, must rule over sin. And then the very next verse re reveals that he went out and killed his brother. That's right. So did he believe? No. No. No, he did not believe. He did not believe. Consider Abraham. And let me stop and ask you, do you know this verse? Do you know this verse? Okay, put it on your bucket list then. It's that important. Go ahead and turn back to Genesis 15, 6. This verse should be on your bucket list. This is perhaps one of the most theologically significant verses in the Old Testament. It is on the same level as Genesis chapter number 3, verse 15. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. When you get there, you're going to like, oh yes, I know this verse. <laughs> Just learn the address. All right, let's look at it together. And he... This is Abram. He hasn't yet been given the new name yet. Abram believed Yahweh. He believed Yahweh. 
All right, let's talk about what he believed. At this point, how many children does Abram have? How many? None. None. All right, they have been to every fertility doctor in the region. They have tried and tried and tried until they can't try anymore. Sarah is much older than Lynn, so that's old. We celebrated Lynn's 80th birthday this morning in Sunday school. We've given him 10 more years, just like that. That's what we do in my Sunday school class. Um, so much older than him. She's old. I mean, she's really, really old. They have zero children, and Yahweh has the audacity to tell him, no, you're going to have a child. No, no, not your servant. No, not your servant. Not this child. No, no, you are going, your wife's going to have a child. You're going to have a child. And when nobody should have believed that, Abram believed that. Abram believed that promise from God. And look what the text says. Yahweh, Yahweh credited, counted it to him as righteousness. So unrighteous Abraham became righteous through an imputation or a crediting or a depositing or an accounting of righteousness. This is my illustration when I use a coat. Come on, y'all see me use this coat. Come on, Elijah, help me out right here. Quickly, quickly, don't wave it around. So this is righteousness. This coat right here that Elijah's wearing is dirty, filthy, nasty, rags. It is a terrible coat. I don't even know why you wore that nasty thing to church. Who let you out of life? Don't look at me. Who let you? Don't look at me. He doesn't even understand instructions. Daniel's getting chosen next time because you can't even keep your head for it. And here's Jesus' righteousness. And what's he do, Steve? He closed little Elijah. Stick your arm through there. Follow instructions. Okay. And Jesus puts that coat on him and says, now you are righteous. Amen. And the imputation of righteousness occurred because of faith in a promise from God. Now, church, you've got to get this. You can't have this jacket. I'm not giving it to you. Sit down. Yeah. Oh, boy. All you self-confidence builders. Good job right there. Give him a trophy, John. He does deserve one daily with me. That's right. Yeah. Listen, we've got to be able to explain this. People want us to be able to give an answer and a defense, an apologia. You are, have to be the theologian in your platoon. You have to be the theologian in your place of business. You, John, have to be the theologian on your floor in the shop when someone says something ridiculous about God, salvation, Christ. Who's going to set them straight? Who's going to open their mouth and present a theologically correct answer? Men and women have always, from the beginning, been saved through faith in a promise from God. Amen. Now, what you need to understand is that the very first promise was small. What do you mean it was small? You, Eve, are going to have a son who will crush the head of the serpent. And that's all she had to believe in order to be saved. And then after that, more information was given and more information was given. And the revelation got larger and larger and larger as God continued to reveal himself to humanity. And today, we now have the complete revelation Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus has come, and our faith must be in the totality of the revelation. But it's always, from the beginning then, faith in a promise from God results in the imputation of righteousness. Nod your head if you're getting it. From the beginning, it's never been different. This is most clearly seen in, in a simple way. That when you look at the Septuagint, that's our 70 right there, LXX, 50, 10, and 10. That's our Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. It is John's word for believe. Same Greek word. So from the beginning, all humans were born with a sin nature and each in a state of unbelief. And each must choose to believe in Yahweh and the promise is revealed at the time for humans. No one has ever been saved by good works. It has always been, it has always been by grace through faith. Now you say, what about all these other things like 
regeneration and repentance and this repentance and obedience and baptism and worship. Church, either they're flowing into or they're flowing out of belief. What do you mean? Well, you are spiritually dead, and unless you're brought alive, you can't believe. So you need to be born again. You need to be born again or regenerated or made alive. But from a human perspective, you can't make that happen. Or like in the book of Acts where God grants them repentance. Well, you can't make God grant you anything. But the outworking of this God granting repentance right here is believing. So this is the human component. This is the human component. And then the blue arrows, repentance, obedience, baptism, worship, they flow out of the orange box of believing. I, I do repent because I believe. I do obey because I believe. I am getting baptized because I believe. I worship the Lord because I believe. Is that clear to you guys? Amen. So the official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies, completely undeterred by the rebuke. So Jesus responds, go your way, go, go, your son will live. And the Bible says the man believed. It's really important that we pay attention to this. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. So at this point, his faith is in the fact that your son will live. That's why he's leaving and he's going to go check on his son. So let's talk about the importance of this, I must believe. I must believe with all my heart. What does that mean? So let's pause for just a minute here. This is my brain. This is the human brain. And this is where I start thinking about Jesus. But in this thinking about Jesus, learning about Jesus, his person, his work, who he is, the miracles he does, all, filling my brain with all this information, this is not salvific. I needed to move here. I needed to move into this Valentine heart right here, and I'm not endorsing that capitalistic holiday, okay? <laughs> right? But I chose the red Valentine heart instead of the physical heart because I wanted you to see I'm not talking about the biological heart. I'm talking about the seat of your affections. Right. Amen. Do you love Jesus? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That was good. That was good. So let me see if I can illustrate this a little bit more. I brought with me a couple tools to help illustrate this. So here is a small pruning saw. And this is actually a, a good pruning saw right here. Let me hold it up to you right here. And this is excellent for small light work pruning. It, it's very sharp and it'll, it'll tear up a limb all day long. And you can do a good job going like this. And if you had a very small project, you could use this and you probably wouldn't get too exhausted right here. This is a hand pruner and it's fairly well. And, and I want you, John, you can hold on to this. I want you to imagine that you own that saw and that's the only saw you've ever used and you love using that saw and you do all your pruning. All right, y'all follow me? Y'all follow me or not? Okay. I go over to John's house and I see that he's got a row of crepe myrtles like you've never seen before. That actually looks like an orchard of crepe myrtles and you're working on pruning these saws one at a time. And he's out there in his hot sun right here and he's going back and forth like this. And I say to him, hey John, have you ever heard of a chainsaw before? And he says, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I introduce him to this great steel saw made in Germany, one of the few things that they still make in Germany right here. And I say, have you ever seen one before? And he says, no, I have no idea what it's all about. And I said, well, let me show you. So let's see if I can get this thing. So I fire it up. Right? I get this thing. Come on, run. And I introduce it to him. I'll turn it off because of, you know, the smell and all that. And I say, John, this thing will make, I mean, you, you'll be amazed at how you want to trade. That's true. Yeah. I said, you'll blast through your trees. I said, it's light. You just one, boom, boom, boom. And I, and I even go and I get an extra chain for him. And I say, hey, John, here, catch, catch. I said, that's a brand new chain right there. Put that on there afterwards. And I tell him all about the good things and I demonstrate it for him. Y'all follow me this morning, soldiers? Y'all follow me this morning? Nod your head. So the next day I go back to his house. And there you are, John. And I say, John, did you believe me concerning the chainsaw? And he says, yeah, I believe it's a great piece of gear. 
I think it'll really do a good job. That was sound effects, church. That's him getting tired, doing it by hand. Now, what are you illustrating right now? Why are you bringing us this illustration? May I have my saw back? If you really believe that this is better than this, then you'll actually use it. You can have all the intellectual knowledge about how this is a better chainsaw, Jim, but until I see you using it, I don't know if you really believe. How many people are in the church and they're like this? They're like this. What is this? This is working your way to Christ. Being a good Christian, doing all the right things. And I'm going, the chainsaw's better! (laughs) How many people grew up in a church and they know all about the chainsaw, but they've never actually used it? Or how many people have so much knowledge about Jesus, but have never truly trusted in Him? I'm trying to give you another illustration. Yes, brain versus love Jesus. This saw right here versus, yeah, I know all about this power saw, but I never use it. Steve, there are literally tens and tens of thousands upon thousands of people who know all about Jesus, but they're not saved. There's no evidence that they're saved. They never pick up the chainsaw and use it. They love their handsaw and they're trying to please the Lord by their own good works. And Christ says, stop working for your salvation. I'll cut the trees down for you. (coughs) Yes or no, guys? I've used a ladder before. I'm trying to think about every possible illustration you can think of to help us understand that a head full of Jesus doesn't mean you're saved. John chapter 2. They believed in him when they saw the miracles, but he did not entrust himself to them. Josh, your goal is to get these two, Elijah and Daniel, to move from here to here. And you want to see evidences like them asking questions and they want to be baptized and they're singing the songs of their own accord and they open the word of God on their own accord and they show that they're dependent upon Christ, not a head full of knowledge. It is so important that we understand the difference. That's the point of this narrative. John chapter 8, verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me. If you see no evidence that you love God, or your son doesn't love God, or your wife doesn't love God, stop thinking they're saved. That's what that is. Am I saying they're not? No, I'm not saying that. I don't know whether they're saved or not. But you can tell me, John Flock, all day long, you think a chainsaw is the greatest thing in the world and it'll do a better job. But every time you pick this up instead of the chainsaw, you're demonstrating I really don't believe you. Because if you did, you'd grab the chainsaw and you'd run it until the entire project was done. Because I promise you, you can't even keep up with me. I'll be done before, I mean, you'll be on your first tree and I'll have the orchard done. And that's the difference between you trying to work your way, which will never happen, and Christ having accomplished it all on your behalf. And the Bible's full of these rebuffs. It's incredible how many verses are like this. Unbelief is completely unacceptable. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 58, in the Nazbe, it reads, and he did not, he did not do many miracles there. Why? Because of their unbelief. In Romans chapter 11, verse 20, quite rightly, they, referring to Israel, were broken off because of their unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19, so we, we see that they, Israel, Israel, were not able to enter where? The promised land, the PL, the promised land. Why? Because of their unbelief. 
In reality, there are only two groups of people on the entire planet. There are either believers or unbelievers. And everything else flows out of that. Chapter 4, verse 51, and he was going down. His servants met him and told him, and his son was recovering. This must have been amazing. So he digs into this with some questions. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And then already having told us that he believed, the text tells us again, and he himself. Now, why does the English language do that? Why does the English language, we already know it's he. We could easily say, and he believed. But why would you add this additional uh, possessive pronoun right here? Why does the author do that? Why would any English author do that? Emphasis. 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 Yeah. And he himself believed. And then as though not, not just him, but others, mom, cousins, servants, anyone else that was in that household believed. So we ask the question, is the believe in verse 53 different from the verse 50? Because they're the same Greek word. So let's consider the parallel structure between verses 39 and 42, verses 50 to 53. Here's on the screen for you. So in the blue is our story about the Samaritans. So let's line them up side by side. Verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him. Why? Because of the woman's testimony, he told me all that I ever did. This is very similar to Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Then we have a few additional details. Verse 40, going back to our Samaritan. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said. We believe for we have heard for ourselves. Do you see how that we have that plural additional? Here's the we right there. And then here we have ourselves. Now let's compare that to John chapter number four, verse 53. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he, here's the, the parallel right there. He himself, ourselves, believed. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you think that that's a coincidence? Or do you think John structured it so that you would see that parallel? Do you think that that's a coincidence or do you think John structured that gospel so that you and I could see that incredible parallel? I think it's, it's side by side. He's showing us that that official became like the Samaritans and not just that official, but also the household. Do you see the we over there for we believe? And do you see and his household? When you add the household, you have a we, don't you? And it's two groups of people that have come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ. So let's review and we'll be done. Number one, the Gospel of John was written to move people from unbelief to belief. Never forget that. From an unbeliever to a believer so that the one who believes may have eternal life in and through Christ Jesus, their Lord and Savior. I get that from John chapter 20, verse 31. This was the purpose statement. Do you remember this? We talked about this in the very beginning of our study. This is the purpose in writing this. These are written, referring to everything in the book, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life, and by life we mean eternal life in his name. Number two, and there are only six. Belief in his name is the means whereby, it's the means by which we become children of God. Now, this is a bit confusing 
because there is a sense in which God is the father of all humans on the planet. But we must be born again to become a child of God. So is there a sense in which God is the father of all? Yes, but they are not children. In fact, the Bible goes out of its way to say that wrath is abiding on them. Wrath. Yes. Wrath. <laughs> I get this from John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who, referring to the all, believed in his name, the name of Jesus, he gave them this, this right to become children of God. To become children of God. Number three. Believe is a present tense verb. You can't have believed and presently not believe and have eternal life. Believe is a present tense verb. You can't have believed and presently not believe and have eternal life. However, a word of caution is needed. So let's clarify it. <clears throat> Imagine for a moment. Come on, come on, stay with me. Let's go back to the chainsaw illustration so we can make this locket solid. John starts with the chain, the handsaw. Got it? I teach him all about the, the chainsaw. The next day, he's just using it, using it. He's been cutting, 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 all that. I have not witnessed any of that. And the moment I show up at your house, you've set this down, and you're doing a little small work with that. And I go, John doesn't believe. But there's a whole day of believing. Y'all follow what I'm saying? I'm trying to create a, a parallel. How many would be honest this morning and say, there have been moments where I've had unbelief? All right, the rest of you are liars, okay? <laughs> Because everyone's had a moment of unbelief. There's no one that hasn't had a moment of unbelief. Let's be honest. So, sister, we're not talking about moments of unbelief. It's not what we're talking about. When I say that you've got to present tense be believing. John, it's when you take the chainsaw and you throw it in the dumpster and you say, I'm never going to use that chainsaw again. That's the type of rejection that we're talking about. There are many, many people who subscribe to the idea that if you've ever touched the chainsaw, you're eternally secure forever. But the Bible teaches that you must believe, present tense verb. In other words, I can't, Drew, I can't reject Christ and then go back to a four-year-old time when I had a moment with Christ and somehow think that I'm eternally secure. We're not talking about moments of doubt. What do we do in moments of doubt? When we follow the Bible example of, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Help me. God knows that you are dust. God knows you're clay. God knows you're going to struggle. John the Baptist struggled. Are you the one or should we be looking for another one? Did Jesus rip his face off? No. He said, tell John this to build him up, to encourage him. All right, just a couple more, very quickly. Number four, one's choice not to believe in Christ results in condemnation. One's choice to believe in Christ results in the imputation of Christ's righteousness. See jacket illustration. <laughs> yeah, that's when I put that good looking jacket on that nasty jacket, all right. Number five. Christ is not okay with your unbelief. He understands. He understands that my, 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 I had a rough childhood. He understands that I can't get over this. He understands. No. 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 Literally get over it. I'm not trying to minimize your struggles with life and all the difficulties, but you don't get a buy because you had a rough life. Jesus tells Thomas, let me show it to you. Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve. Jesus is yelling to you this morning. Do not disbelieve. Number six, and we're done. Believing is not Christ's only expectation for you. We're 
not suggesting that it's only believing in the sense that that's all he expects. We're saying that only believing is necessary for salvation. But church, once you're saved, salvation, once you're saved, there's a lot that he expects out of you. For example, in John chapter 10, verse 26 and 27, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. So you're not among my sheep, which is why you do not believe. My sheep, believers, they hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And let's clarify what following him is and then we'll be done. Following Jesus is Christ-like transformation. And what is that? It's becoming more like Jesus every day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word and the truth that it teaches. I pray, God, that if there's even one, one, one unbeliever in this assembly, <clears throat> that you would convict them in the deepest recesses of their heart, of their need to believe the gospel. I pray, God, that you would waken them up to the reality that they're not saved, that their belief is empty, that their belief is in vain, that their belief is futile, that their belief is less than salvific, and they must repent of this unbelief and put their faith in Christ today before it's too late. In Jesus' name, amen.